Scout, The Secret of the Swamp. The author is Pete Prince, read by John Froma. Chapter 1. The Stranger. The pet shop was alive with noise and movement. Songbirds fluted, parakeets squawked, and a brightly colored parrot fluttered his eyelids and screeched. In one large cage, a spider monkey was swinging on the branch of a dead tree. There were also dogs, big ones and little ones, each in his own pen. There were yappy little whelps and calm, noble beasts, expensive, pedigreed dogs and cheap, friendly mongrels. In one cage, staring through the wire mesh, sat a German shepherd puppy with a beautifully marked head. His intelligent eyes stared sadly out into the world. He was lonesome. The puppy had been born two months earlier on a big farm and was used to open fields. For the last three days he had been locked up in the strange surroundings of the crowded pet store. The sudden change was very hard on the puppy. He was well cared for, but no one ever petted him or took him outside for a run. On the street in front of the pet shop, a small station wagon pulled up. Out of it stepped a man and a boy, about ten years old. I want a puppy for my son, said the man. The storekeeper opened several cages and showed the boy a number of puppies. But each time the boy shook his head, and so did the father. Then the storekeeper lifted the German shepherd puppy from his cage and set him on the floor. Happy to regain his freedom, the puppy wagged his tail joyfully and began sniffing about in the store. Oh, father, isn't he beautiful? Can I have that one? I've already thought of a name for him. See the way he's sniffing around? He must be a good tracker. So I'll call him Scout. Well, all right, Tom, said the boy's father, if you're sure you want him. He's going to grow up into a big dog, you know, and you'll have to take care of him. A few minutes later, when the car pulled away from the pet store, Scout was sitting in the front seat between Tom and his father. Soon they were leaving the city. They drove through the country that Scout had never seen before. But Scout felt the hand of his new master stroking his head, and he was happy. After about an hour's drive, the car turned up a long driveway to a large, remodeled farmhouse. On the fence hung a sign, Heath View. The station wagon stopped by the side door. Scout was led into the house. First he came into a large porch where his nails clicked on the linoleum. Then he was coaxed down a carpeted hallway to the living room. A tall, handsome woman jumped to her feet and opened her mouth in happy surprise. Look, Mum, isn't he beautiful? Oh, he is, and he'll make a fine watchdog, too, exclaimed Mother. Everyone admired Scout, including the housekeeper and the gardener. They all petted him and spoke to him in friendly voices. Then Tom took the puppy into another room, a light, airy room, where a young girl lay in bed. She was Tom's sister, Ina. She had been ill for a long time and was slowly starting to recover. But she would have to remain in bed for some time yet. Ina, too, thought Tom had made a good choice. When you're in school, he can come into my room and play with me, she said. That was all right with Tom, and with Scout, too. He barked and wagged his tail happily. The days that followed were happy ones for Scout. Every day he played and romped with Tom, and chased around the large yard with him. Sometimes he spent hours in Ina's bedroom, learning funny little tricks and listening to her friendly voice. At night he slept in his own basket in the kitchen. At mealtimes he was spoiled by everyone, and he quickly grew into a strong young dog. One day, as Scout was wandering about in the backyard, enjoying the sun and exploring, he put his head through the hedge. Suddenly, he was startled. 
Right beside him were the legs and tattered boots of a foul-smelling man who was standing on the other side of the hedge, studying the house. The man was startled, too, when the German shepherd's head came poking through the hedge. He aimed a hard kick at the dog's nose, but Scout was too quick for him. Scout wasn't afraid of the man. He bared his teeth and growled. Then the man suddenly changed his behavior. He bent forward toward Scout, clucking his tongue and patting his leg. Here, boy, come here, good boy. Look what I've got for you. From his pocket, he pulled a chunk of meat and held it out to Scout. The meat smelled delicious, but Scout sensed that the man was not a friend. The man's foul smell mingled with that of the meat. The dog ignored the outstretched hand and fixed his eyes on the man's face, growling deeply. The gardener came walking into the backyard, whistling. The man mumbled a few curses, and dropping the meat back into his pocket, he hurried off, still crouching behind the hedge. Several days later, in the middle of the night, as he lay sleeping in his box in the kitchen, Scout was suddenly awakened. Had he heard a strange noise in his sleep? He pricked up his ears and listened, but heard nothing. Nevertheless, something was amiss. He sniffed. There was a strange smell in the house. A stranger? The fur on his neck bristled. He remembered that foul smell. Growling softly, he rose to his feet. Now he also heard noises. The door to the study was partly open. When Scout peered into the room, he saw a man with a bright torch burning a hole in a large black cabinet. A second man was bending over him, but Scout paid no attention to him, for he recognized the man with the torch. It was the man at the hedge who had tried to kick him. Scout shot through the doorway like an arrow and was on the man in an instant. With a smothered cry, the safe cracker dropped the torch, but at the same time the other man brought a steel pipe down on Scout's head, and the dog sank to the floor without uttering a sound. There, he's dead, whispered the man. He won't bother us again. But he was wrong. Several hours later, Scout regained consciousness. Daylight was streaming in through the windows. The safe stood wide open and empty. The burglars had escaped with everything. Kobe, the young housekeeper, bent over him, crying. She was usually the first one to be up and around in the morning, and she had discovered the robbery. Oh, oh, how awful, she wailed. And just when Mr. and Mrs. Sanders are away, those burglars must have known. Oh, oh, they've stolen everything and nearly killed poor Scout. Scout wagged his tail a little to show that in spite of the roaring in his ears, he was far from dead. But when he tried to get up, he toppled over again and lapsed back into unconsciousness. When he came to for the second time, a veterinarian was bandaging the gaping wound in his head. Tom hovered over him with tears in his eyes. Also in the room were two policemen, one of whom was busily writing in a small notebook. Poor Scout, said Tom. If only he could talk, then he could tell the police what happened. But it was too late anyway. The robbers were long gone. Chapter 2. On the Trail That afternoon, Scout was already feeling much better. When Kobe put his favorite dog food before him, he ate hungrily, and later he began roaming about the house again. Tom had stayed home from school. He was sitting in Ina's room talking about what had happened. I wish Dad and Mom were home, said Tom. They should have the telegram by now, I think. Maybe they'll come home tonight. Scout was sniffing about in the backyard. The two policemen had left and everything seemed to be back to normal. But the clever dog sensed that something was still amiss. 
A little later, Tom joined him in the backyard. Tom was feeling somewhat tense and tried to unwind by playing a little with his dog. But Scout didn't feel much like playing. They ended up near the back of the large yard, close to the hedge. Suddenly, Scout stood still and growled. There was the opening that he had put his head through when the burglar had been spying on the house. It seemed to be much larger now. The tangled branches of the hedge had been bent back and broken. Scout sniffed at the spot excitedly. He smelled that strange, foul smell. Tom looked at him. What was Scout doing? Then he too saw the opening in the hedge. From one of the branches dangled a small shred of cloth. It must have been ripped from the clothes of whoever had come through the hedge. Suddenly Tom understood. The burglars must have come through here. Tom had an idea. He took the shred of cloth from the branch and held it in front of Scout's nose. Find him, Scout. Fetch, he said. Scout sniffed and immediately headed for the hole in the hedge and squeezed through. Tom was right behind him. The dog trotted away into the dusk, his nose close to the ground. Tom had a hard time keeping up to his tracking dog. For a short distance, they followed the dirt road that passed behind their property. But soon Scout turned off on a trail that led out onto the wide heath. It was almost dark when they reached the trail. Tom was becoming a little uneasy, but he decided to go on anyway. The darkness didn't bother Scout, but for Tom it was rough going. The moon was almost full, however, and as it rose higher in the sky, Tom could pick his way over the rough terrain more easily. There were no farms or houses of any kind to be seen. In every direction that he looked, Tom could see only the low brush and the spiky grass clumps of the heath. He and Scout seemed to be the only creatures moving for many kilometers around. The path had petered out, and once in a while Scout seemed to lose the trail for he would go sniffing round and round in circles. Sometimes, too, he would go back a short way, but each time he picked up the trail again. At last they reached the other side of the heath. It was becoming very late, and Tom was exhausted. He tried to call Scout back to head home, but the dog went on, his nose still to the ground. They were now on the edge of a large forest, and Scout pushed his way through the underbrush. Reluctantly, Tom followed. The branches lashed at him and snagged his clothes. This was worse than the heath. He was almost sobbing with fatigue and anxiety. Just as he was thinking about turning back without Scout if necessary, he saw a faint glow of light between the trees. It was just for a moment, and then the woods were dark again. Tom found himself on a winding path. Suddenly, it widened into a clearing. Against the blackness of the dense woods, he could just make out the shape of a sagging old shack. A narrow strip of light showed under the door. This must be where the light came from, thought Tom. Someone must have opened and closed the door. Scout was standing in front of the shack. A low, threatening growl rose from deep in his throat. Shh, here, Scout, whispered Tom. He cautiously circled the shack. It seemed to be divided into two rooms. There was light in the front room, but the only window had been covered with a piece of cardboard. Near the bottom of the cardboard, however, was a small slit. Tom sneaked up to the window and by standing on his toes he could peek through the slit into the room. Two men were sitting at a wobbly old table. Between them stood a big bottle and three glasses, and also a metal money box. Tom stared in surprise. He recognized the box. 
He had seen father taking it out of the safe many times. The men were talking. Tom held his ear against the window and listened attentively. He was so absorbed in what the men were saying, he didn't notice that Scout was acting restlessly and growling angrily. Tom could catch only snatches of the conversation. The men were talking about someone called Max and about a car, but much more than that he couldn't understand. Suddenly, strong fingers seized him by the neck and jerked him away from the window. At the same moment, Scout launched himself at Tom's attacker, barking furiously. Tom struggled wildly to get out of the man's grasp, but without success. The man's companions inside the shack immediately came storming outside in response to his cries for help. One of them wielded a big club. Tom thought he was done for. But then his attacker uttered a scream of pain as Scout sank his teeth into the man's arm. In trying to shake off the dog, he let go of Tom with one hand, and Tom tore himself loose. But now the other two men had also arrived. Tom saw one of them bringing down his club hard on Scout's wounded head. The dog dropped like a sack of grain. The other man made a grab for Tom. But Tom dodged him and then dove into the trees. The moon was hiding behind the clouds so Tom could hardly see where he was going. Wild with panic, he ran through the trees and bushes. A branch whipped his face, hurting him badly, but he ran on, faster and faster, away from those angry voices behind him. He stepped on a slippery tree root and skidded sideways, falling headlong to the ground. He scrambled up to run on, but a stabbing pain in his ankle stopped him. He tried again, but the ankle wouldn't support his weight. He must have sprained it. He stumbled ahead a few steps, wincing with pain, but his pursuers were catching up. Not knowing what else to do, he quickly crawled into a thick clump of bushes. One of the men walked right by his hiding place and stopped to peer into the tangled growth. Tom held his breath, but the man saw nothing. The voices faded away and Tom began to breathe easier. His foot, however, ached terribly. Listen, the men were coming back. One of them was carrying a flashlight this time. He's got to be hiding around here somewhere. He can't have gotten away so quickly, Tom heard one of them say. His heart pounded with terror. Lord, help me, he prayed silently. The beam of the flashlight came closer. Look, said the same voice. Here are the boy's tracks. They stop here. Let's look over there. The burglar pushed into the bushes shining his flashlight ahead of him. The light caught Tom full in the face. Okay, boy, come on out, said the man with a nasty laugh. We've got a much better spot for you. When Tom made no move to get up from where he was sitting, the man grabbed Tom by his jacket and dragged him out of the bushes. Tom was on the verge of tears, but he bit his lip and forced back the tears. The men asked him his name and demanded to know what he had heard at the window, but Tom said nothing. They shoved him ahead of them back to the shack. He limped forward on his sprained ankle, dizzy with pain. When he got to the shack, the bottle was still standing on the table, but the money box was gone. You won't be running off again with that sprained ankle, said the man who had found him. In an hour or so... It will be so swollen, you won't be able to take a single step. But just to make sure, I'm going to tie your hands behind your back. With the help of one of the other burglars, he tied Tom's hands tightly behind his back. Then he opened the door to the other unlit room and shoved Tom inside, adding in a threatening tone, One peep out of you, and we'll fix you like your dog. 
Tom was left standing alone in the blackness of the small room. His foot was burning and throbbing, his shoe was beginning to pinch, and the rope was biting painfully into his wrists. He lowered himself to the floor and sat there, thinking. Although he was in poor shape himself, he had not forgotten his faithful friend Scout. He was very worried about him. Had he been killed by the man with the club? Was he lying outside the shack dead? With some difficulty, Tom managed to get back on his feet. His eyes were beginning to get used to the darkness, and he had decided to explore the room a little. With his hands tied on his back, that wasn't easy, but he didn't give up. He found nothing in the room except built into one wall was an old-fashioned closet bed with a smelly old mattress lying in it. When he shuffled farther into the room, he suddenly got an awful scare. In the far corner, his foot bumped into something soft, something alive. Tom's heart pounded in his throat. He hardly dared to hope. Forgetting to be careful, he dropped to his knees and turned his back toward the object on the floor, groping at it with his tied hands. He felt something furry and warm. It was Scout. He was lying on the floor, motionless. Tom could have shouted with joy, but at the same time he became aware of his own utter helplessness. Carefully he groped farther until he found Scout's head. He felt something sticky. Blood. The dog moaned quietly. Fear flashed through Tom's body. Scout could be lying there slowly bleeding to death, and Tom was unable to help him. He had to get his hands free and take care of Scout's wound. Feverishly he tried to think of something. Might there be a sharp nail or something jutting from the wall on which he could cut the rope from his wrists? He stood up once more and went around the entire room searching the wall. Nothing. Then he had another idea. In his right pants pocket was a jackknife, but with his hands tied he couldn't reach it. Lying down flat on the floor, he wriggled and squirmed until his pants twisted around his body, so that he could just reach the edge of his pocket with his fingers. He seized the edge and tugged until the side seam of his pants gave with a sudden rip. After that, it was only a matter of working the bottom of the pocket upward until the knife slid out onto the floor. Ah, there it was. Quickly he sat up and a moment later he had the knife in his hands. Getting it open, however, was no easy matter. It cost him a couple of broken fingernails. And to cut the rope with the open knife was even more of a problem. He just couldn't get enough leverage. But Tom had already thought of something else. When he had searched the walls for a nail, in one place he had found a wide crack between two boards. He shuffled over toward the spot and managed to wedge the handle of his knife into the crack. Then he carefully rubbed the ropes binding his wrists along the knife blade. It was a tricky business. Twice the handle slipped out of the crack. And once he received a nasty cut in the side of his palm. But finally the ropes began to give. He wrenched hard and the ropes snapped. Loud laughter sounded in the other room. The three burglars seemed to be in a good mood. As he started crawling back across the room toward his wounded dog, suddenly a wet nose was snuffling at him. Scout had revived and sought out his master. Again, loud voices sounded from the room next to Tom's prison. I'm telling you, Max must have had car trouble. Otherwise, he'd have been here long ago. And I'll bet you he shows up before daybreak, someone argued. He'd better, because I want to put a good distance between myself and this place before morning, growled another voice. But what are we going to do with that boy? 
Shut up, said the third man, who seemed more sober than the other two. Wait a minute. Tom heard his chair grate across the floor. Immediately, he grasped what the man was doing. Scout, play dead scout, he whispered right into the dog's ear. It was a trick he and Ina had taught Scout when he was still a puppy. The dog lay flat on the floor, his legs extended and his eyes closed. Tom lay down next to him, his hands behind his back as though he were still tied. He was just in time. The door opened and one of his captors shone a flashlight into the room. Tom and Scout both lay motionless and after a few moments the door closed again. It's okay. I think the dog is finished this time, and that boy has fallen asleep, the man said, satisfied. When we leave, we'll tie our little snooper so he can't move, and we'll put a gag over his mouth. Someone should find him in a couple of days, but then we'll be long gone. And if that blasted dog isn't already dead, I'll cut his throat before we leave. Tom shuddered. He and Scout had bought a little time. But if they didn't get out of their prison soon, his future looked bleak. What if he had to lie in the shack for days, gagged and tied up so he couldn't move? If he wasn't found in time, he might die of starvation, and Scout would be killed for sure. The men went on talking. Tom was beginning to understand what was going on. Max was the fourth burglar who was supposed to come and pick up the others with a car. When Tom had arrived at the shack and sneaked up to the window, one of the men had been out by the road looking for Max. That had been Tom's undoing. His thoughts went back to Scout. The dog was still bleeding, and sometimes he moaned quietly. Tom had to do something for him. He took off his shirt and cut it into strips with his jackknife. Then he bandaged Scout's head as well as he could. The dog didn't resist in the least. Suddenly Tom noticed that the room seemed to be getting lighter. He could now see Scout's head. Where was the light coming from? When he looked up, he found out. In the roof was a gaping hole. As long as it had been dark outside, the hole had been invisible. But now the moon had broken through the thick cloud cover and was shining into the hole. One of the boards in the roof was broken and a couple of roof tiles were missing. The sky was clearly visible. Looking up into the sky, Tom suddenly felt very calm. The Lord could see him down here in this dark shack. He closed his eyes and asked God to save him. As he opened his eyes, another idea came to him. The hole in the roof was directly over the built-in bed. Maybe he could climb through the hole. He stood up and started to walk toward the bed. Immediately, a stabbing pain reminded him of his ankle. It was now so swollen, he could hardly bend it at all. He couldn't take a single step without doubling up with pain. He sat down on the floor again and removed his shoe. Then he wound the remaining strips of cloth that had been cut from his shirt tightly around his ankle. That helped, but not enough that he could walk. Still, he didn't want to give up on his idea. Suddenly, he thought, what if Scout could get through the hole and bring help? The dog had been badly hurt, but he was again sniffing around the room. Scout was unusually smart. Maybe Tom could make him understand. Tom limped to the bed and carefully climbed up on it. Now he could just reach the hole with his hands. The opening wasn't wide enough, but the boards were extremely rotten. If he pulled hard, he was sure he could make the hole bigger. He would also have to push aside some of the roof tiles, but then the men in the next room would certainly hear it. He stood still and listened for many minutes, his hand on the rotten board. The three burglars must have drained the bottle by now, for they were becoming quite noisy. One of them told a joke, and the room echoed with loud laughter. Crack! 
went aboard. It broke off as Tom tugged with all his might. But the laughter drowned out the noise, and it went unnoticed by the three men as did Tom's cry of pain. One of the roof tiles came tumbling in through the hole and had fallen right on his sore foot. Tom fought back the tears at the intense pain that shot through his ankle. Fortunately, it soon let up. Now, the hole was large enough, but he couldn't very well climb through it himself and try to escape on his sore ankle. Tom felt Scout's nose against his knee. The dog had also jumped up on the bed. The moon was shining brightly through the jagged hole, and Tom could see the bloody bandaged head of his dog quite clearly. The bandage seemed to have helped, for Scout was steady on his feet again and looked quite alert. I've got to risk it, thought Tom. I can't make it myself so Scout will have to go for help. He pointed to the hole and tried to lift the German Shepherd, but that was out of the question. Scout had put on a lot of weight in the past year and had become a heavy dog, too heavy for Tom to lift. He'd have to find some other way. He stood and thought a moment. Then he had an idea. He stooped down, lifted Scout's face upward, and pointed to the hole. Through there, Scout. Jump, boy. Up. Up. Run home. Home, boy. He repeated this once more, pointing up at the hole. Scout wagged his tail and whined softly, as if he wanted to say, I understand, but it's too high. But Tom had thought of that. He listened to the sounds in the next room for a moment. The burglars were still talking loudly. Then Tom stooped forward, putting his hands on his knees, and whispered, Jump, Scout, jump. The dog understood. With his first jump, he landed on Tom's back. Tom swayed momentarily as a sharp pain shot up his leg because of the heavy weight on his back, but he caught himself. Then Scout jumped again and disappeared through the hole. Tom heard him landing on the roof tiles, then followed a muffled thump. The dog had jumped to the ground. Tom listened with bated breath whether the men inside had heard the noise, but the talk in the other room went on uninterrupted. Closing his eyes, Tom thanked God that the plan had worked, and he prayed that Scout might make it home safely and quickly return with help. After he had prayed, his fear ebbed. Chapter 3 the search. At Heathview, the home of the Sanders, there was no rest and peace that night. Tom's parents had come home from their trip that evening. They already knew about the burglary, but a new shock awaited them upon their return. Tom had disappeared. The anxious parents forgot all about the robbery. All they could think of was their boy. Tom's two best friends were contacted immediately, but neither of them had seen him. Kobe discovered that Scout, too, was gone. Then a frightening thought came to Mr. Saunders' mind. What if the boy and the dog had gone off on the trail of the burglars? Perhaps they had been caught by the crooks. Mr. Sanders immediately called the police and it wasn't long before a motorcycle with a sidecar came driving up to the house. Two policemen came to the door. Everyone in the house was questioned about when they had last seen Tom, including Ina. Ina, who still had to get plenty of rest, had seen Tom and Scout playing in the backyard from her bedroom window. She had seen them disappear through the hedge. That was not long before sundown. Well, sir, said the older of the two policemen, I'm sorry, but it wouldn't do much good for us to start searching tonight. Tomorrow we'll get us a good tracking dog from the city police. Then we'll pick up your boy's trail, and we might even find the thieves. But by then our boy may have been murdered, sobbed Tom's mother. 
The policeman turned up his palms and shrugged. We can't do much now, madam. Tomorrow we'll broadcast your son's description over the radio and look for him with the dog. There may be nothing to worry about. Outside, the pale light of the moon shone on the woods and fields. Across the wide heath plodded a dog, his head wrapped in blood-soaked bandages. He swayed on his feet and made his way forward very slowly. The dog's powerful body was burning with fever, sapping almost all his strength. But he dragged himself on, for he knew that Tom was in great danger and that he had to fetch help. Once he stopped at a large puddle and drank greedily. The two policemen were ready to leave. Mr. Sanders escorted them to the door. One of the men climbed into the sidecar, and the other straddled the seat and started the engine. He waved to Mr. Sanders and started to drive away. At that moment, the figure of a dog passed through the beam of the headlight, wobbled up to the steps, and collapsed at Mr. Sanders' feet. It was Scout. Mr. Sanders was seized with fear when he saw the bloody but draggled animal. Stop! he shouted after the departing policeman. The motorcycle stopped. Scout lay motionless as if dead. The men carried him into the house. When they took the bandages from his head, Tom's mother, who was also hovering over the dog, cried out, Those strips were torn from Tom's shirt. It was obvious that something very serious had happened to the dog and that Tom, too, was involved. Tom's parents were more frightened than ever. Mr. Sanders went to the telephone and called the vet. It was some time before anyone answered the phone because the man was already in bed. But when Tom's father told him what had happened, he promised to come immediately. Scout revived and looked about him restlessly. When he saw Tom's father, he wagged his tail a little and then tottered toward the door. When Mr. Sanders opened the door, Scout walked straight down the hall to the front door, looking back to see if the others were following. He wants us to follow him, cried Mr. Sanders. Tom must be in danger. Although the dog tried to resist, Mr. Sanders led him back into the room, for he was still much too weak. Then the vet arrived. He examined the dog and said, He's lost a lot of blood and has been badly weakened, but he has no dangerous injuries. Do you think you can fix him up well enough so that he can lead us to the boy tonight? asked one of the policemen. The vet frowned doubtfully. That's asking a lot, he said, but the dog looks exceptionally strong and tough. If you give him a piece of raw meat to eat, I'll give him a shot that will pick him up. It's a risk, but I understand the boy's life may be in danger. When Scout had received his shot and something to eat, he perked up considerably. He was still restless, however, repeatedly going to the door, scratching at it, and looking questioningly at Mr. Sanders. Come on, Tom's father said at last. We'll just have to try it. Every minute might be precious, and the dog seems to be feeling much better. Mr. Sanders got a long, thin leash from the closet and fastened it to Scout's collar. The vet had already left, but the gardener insisted on going along to search for Tom. He armed himself with a hatchet, while Mr. Sanders selected a heavy cane. The policemen each carried a revolver and a billy club. When the front door was opened, Scout lunged ahead so hard that Mr. Sanders almost lost his grip on the leash. They crossed the moonlit yard and Scout started to go through the hole in the hedge. But the gardener unlocked the back gate and they emerged on the dirt road behind the house. Following the road to the heath, they were soon in the middle of the wide, empty grasslands. All the men were tense and apprehensive about what lay ahead. Scout never hesitated a moment, but went straight on. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. Across the heath ran an old road, used only occasionally by farmers hauling something by horse and wagon. 
As the search party cut across this road, they suddenly saw a car approaching from the left, running without lights. That man must be nuts, muttered one of the policemen. We don't have much time, but I better give him a warning. He stood in the middle of the road and, with his flashlight, signaled the car to stop. Suddenly the headlights of the car blazed on and the driver stepped on the gas. He aimed straight for the policeman who jumped aside at the last second. The car disappeared, roaring away at full speed into the night. Why, that reckless, exclaimed the officer. Did anybody get his license number? No, no one had. The license plate light of the car hadn't been working, and the incident had happened so fast no one had had the chance to get a close look. They were sure, however, that there had been only one person in the vehicle. Then let's keep moving, said Mr. Sanders, who was very anxious about his son and the foursome, led by Scout, continued on its way across the heath. None of them suspected that the man in the car was very intimately involved in the burglary and with Tom.